Good evening all, good evening, good evening, and welcome to the Arboricultural Association's headquarters here in Stonehouse in the UK for our Wednesday webinar. My name's John Parker, I'm Chief Exec at the uh, Association and your host for this evening. Please use the chat to say hello, as many people are doing. Tell us where you're watching from, but select everyone, not just panellists and uh, hosts. So everyone, please, to put your message in. Submit your questions using the Q&A button and we'll work through as many as we possibly can at the end. This evening's webinar is all about a really great charity, Perennial, and how they help those in need who work in horticulture and arboriculture. We're going to be hearing from Helen Waddington, Head of Casework at Perennial, who will provide an overview of what the charity is all about. First of all, before Helen, we'll have a presentation from Ben Preston, Head Gardener at York Gate Gardens, a perennial site near Leeds. I was fortunate enough to visit a few weeks ago for the perennial AGM. I got a tour of the gardens from Ben. It's a fantastic place, packed with some amazing trees, uh, and you should all go and visit. So you're going to learn more about that tonight. But first, a couple of notices. As ever, for some time now, we've been building up towards uh, one of our main events of the year, the 2021 Arboricultural Association Amenity Conference. For the first time ever, this will be entirely online. Uh, it's a big shame in many ways because we very much wanted to have an in-person event, but it's also an opportunity because it means people will be able to attend and participate who might otherwise not have been able to. So we're really looking forward to it. We hope you can join us for Trees and Society. It's next Monday and Tuesday, September the 6th and 7th. There is a ticket cost for this. You've got to buy a ticket, but considering the quality of the speakers, the amount of CPD, uh, and the fact that you get exclusive access to the presentations for months afterwards before anyone else does, makes it a bit of a bargain. So please do consider coming along. We do give away as much stuff as we possibly can for free. Uh, our ethos is to be as inclusive as possible. Um, but at the same time, we are a charity and we need to bring some money in. And I'm afraid the charging conference is all part of that. So I hope you can feel you can come along and support us. We're going to be taking a break from webinars for a while after conference just to get our heads together and make sure we're all prepared for an autumn and winter series that's going to knock your socks off. So look forward to that. We'll let you know more about that as soon as we have a program to share. If you're really keen for more online action, and if you're a member, you have to be a member of the Arb Association, then tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. UK time is the Arb Association Annual General Meeting. Who doesn't love an AGM beamed directly to your home? It's going to be gripping. Just, you've got to be there. So please, if you're a member, register for that in the link that I can see Sophie's just put in the chat. And then one very final plug from me and for some more of our colleagues. This week, I was interviewed for a podcast with our very good friends over at the European Forum on Urban Forestry, uh, which is now available to listen to online at a link that I will share later on. So uh, our friends at EFUP, it's a great organisation, a great event, and uh, they were kind enough to uh, interview me this week. So please get along and listen to that and many of their other interviews that they've got on there. So that's enough nonsense from me. More importantly than any of that, it's my very great pleasure to welcome to the stage Ben Preston. Ben, it's over to you. Perfect. Right. Well, thanks for that wonderful introduction, John. And um, tonight I'm going to, well, as you already explained, I'm head gardener at York Gate Garden, which is one of Perennial's gardens in in the UK. I know there's some of you watching from all over the world. I am... Um, I'm very passionate about this garden and hopefully over the next half an hour or so before I introduce Helen, um, you'll see that. And what makes this a very special garden is, is actually is the fact that it is the flagship garden for perennial, but it's also, it's a very small, it's, for me, it's one of the great small gardens. And I'm going to go through a little bit about the history. Um, and this is, I'm actually starting at the front gate and this is the original front gate to the garden. And probably something that will grip you straight away that it's, it's an arts and crafts style garden. Um, and it's, it's, it's not true arts and crafts because it was designed in the early 50s by the wonderful Spencer family. But we're going to go through the front gate. Um, there we go. Let me go back there. Perfect. Right. So we come through the front gate and I'm going to talk specifically about the trees and the importance of the trees uh, at York Gate this evening, with it being the Arb Association. Um, my passion is... is Oh, I'm a generalist guy. I'm, I'm, I love trees. I love herbaceous. I, I love successional layers. And that starts off with the backbone of a garden. So I'm not just going to talk about trees. I'm going to talk about the way that the species uses that. That might be taxes for the hedging, but also as topiary. And, um, you know, we've got two different types of taxes here with the golden, the golden you at the front with the, the bun, the golden buns. Um, and really the difference in, in evergreen deciduous trees, how we use them for theatre throughout the seasons. Um, 
and I brought it onto the driveway, which is the first of the fault in garden rooms. And there was no rooms here when the Spencers arrived in 1951. They they arrived and um, they they wanted to they had a small hole and they wanted to have horses and, and pigs and sheep, uh, and they quickly realised that they wanted to build this amazing garden. And they were they weren't designers; they were amateurs. Um, Fred and Fred and Robin, the the father and son of the family. Were, were surveyors and they collected artifacts and they, they were they were all great lovers of plants and trees um, and design and designs they were amateurs um, and what they put together is and is this succession of rooms and I'm going to take you through the rooms and show you the special trees that are within the rooms um, and I just thought I'd flick I'm just going to flick back to unfold this photo and I think in garden design if you take all the colour out of a photo you can see the shapes and this 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 photo that I keep flicking back from is um, 2018, we had a wonderful summer. Um, we didn't have any rain for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and this was the this was these were the clouds before the storm, um, which was mid July, um, and then right through to the winter months where you've got this lovely shape. And the one thing that will stick out to you in the middle of this photo is um, what we call the orangutan, which is um, it's a weeping sequoia dendron gigantium pendulum. And um, which those of you that have been to the, the Californian redwoods, um, Redwood National Park in California. The, the tallest trees in the world. This is a this is a pendular version, um, and it was a. I'm not sure where the spot was selected, but it was selected for its habit, and it's got these wonderful arching branches, and you can see them starting to go, and they actually grow vertical to start with, and then they bend. And previous head gardeners have cut limbs off. I let it do whatever it wants. It's various different names: the orangutan, cousin it, the monster. Um, but it is my favourite tree in the garden. It's a great one to start with, and. Um, this is it at, um, at dusk, uh, a wonderful tree. And I think what really what really makes a difference in this garden is it's the contrast between the wild and the turned. Um, and you can see the, the clipped buns there. They, they're no longer golden. They've had their winter, they've had their winter clip. And we opened the garden from from April to, to the end of October. And what you get in that period is um you get plants moving through their life, their, the stages of growth. Um, and rather than, with a toe puree, we don't clip two, three times a year. With these lovely golden buns, we clip them just once a year because I want people who visit the garden on a regular basis to see the change in the plants. And, and Texas, for me, is the, the the great structural plant in the UK for the hedging. Um, it works so well, right? It's a, it's a British native, is is Texas baccata, um, and it's native throughout Europe what we used to use to make our longbows from way back in the day and um, but using this and as you can see right through the center there the, the shark's teeth which actually the use sails in the center of the garden we'll get to that further in the garden but they they are at the center of the garden and wherever you are in the garden you can usually find a, a viewpoint through to the, through to the sails um, and this is the actually the, the the tree that we're just looking at this is in the orchard um, we shouldn't really call the orchard anymore because an orchard is, I think, technically has to have more than three apple trees or three trees, fruit trees. And there's only one left, which is a Keswick codling, which is the left of the photo. And the lovely weeping sky that we're just looking at is actually hiding behind that hanging branch, branch to the left. So this is a view back toward the house. And this is, I wanted to show this view back to the house of, of the ways in which trees are used, not just trees, but Things like this espalier pyracanth that's on the end of the house that is clipped in a very similar fashion to the way that we've clipped from these trees. And, and the wonderful trachycarpus that's, that's stood up against the house, the, the fan palm. And, and it's this use of plants from all over the world that really makes York Gate special. And we're moving through again into the into the pine eatum. And the, this is the miniature pine eatum. And I get very excited when I'm doing it. So when I do a tour of the garden in person, come through the route that I've just come through and you come through the arbor and you look left and this opens up a view of the garden and this looks across three different rooms and these layers of, of rooms and and that that you can see there the the espalier cedrus atlantica glauca the atlas blue cedar is the only is, is the oldest specimen that's trained like this in Europe and it is it's a pleasure it's a pleasure to look at this every time you walk through the garden and um, we'll have a close look at it in a minute and it's it, it just it, it just works. It links the garden together so well, and it, the horizontals work with the verticals of the sails. And we'll move uh, to a different angle in a second to see that. But this this room is all about conifers, um, and 
the word pine eaten doesn't actually mean a collection of, of pines, it's a collection of conifers. And there's all sorts of conifers in this part of the garden. There's, there's cedrus, there's larch, there's, there's abies, there's pinus. On the, on the left there, we've got pinus strobe contorta. At the front of the, the, the glocks, blue at the very front and the bottom of the screen is, is, is an abies um, from Korea, abies coriana. And it's just, it's, it's a very, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the design from this part of the room comes from the Japanese sort of art of, of negative spirits. And you look at the cobbles that are that are mulched underneath underneath the conifers, and it's quite a quiet space in the garden compared to the the flowers and the and the seasonal changes of of the rest of the garden. This is very much it goes through the minimal change through the seasons. It's very very permanent. You get growth on the trees, and there's there's a lovely brewer spruce just to my right there, and it's it's great. And you look across, and you can see a few flocks coming to flower. This is a picture from last summer. But it really sets off, it, it quietens you down before the intensities of the, of the other parts of the garden. And I want to draw you back a bit further and see it in black and white again. And there are the great you sails in the middle. And actually, that the horizontals of the cedrus with the uprights of the sails, it, it starts to make sense as you move through the garden. And it's really arts and crafts for me. And, and some of you may have been to Hidcote. It's the theatre of the garden and where you see next and the hidden views and the vistas. And the many different views in this garden make the garden feel much, much bigger than it is. You know, we've probably only walked around an eighth of an acre so far on this tour. Um, and the whole the whole Spencer legacy is only one acre. The whole site is six acres. But the, the 14 garden rooms are crammed into one acre and every single bit of the garden is used and it's linked together and it draws your eye through. And there's almost this is where you, the, the garden changes from year on year, and you'll you'll see the dark silhouette of the of the weeping the weeping beech in the in the distance there, and that that's it, they look like very mature trees, and the one to the the right of the foreground, which is very upright, looks like a Lombardy poplar. That's also a beech. It's Fagus uh, sylvatica uh, Doric, or Doric, which is the gardens up in Scotland, and I think the the new ways of gardening are very. Um, they were very quick. We want things at our fingertips, and perennial gardening is a way of of getting things what we want very quickly. But the permanence and the um, and the patience that's needed for growing trees and shrubs make a garden feel very permanent, and it gives a it gives a timeless feel to a garden. And, and that is what this garden does so so well is that I can play around with herbaceous levels, and I can pull things out, and I can create new planting schemes. But these trees and these views and these vistas, yeah, they change ever so slightly, but. They're very, very permanent and they give this garden such a timeless feel. And for me, that's what makes this garden and many other gardens so special. Um, and this, I took this photo one evening, a uh, year before last, it was 20, 2019. And there's so much going on in this photo. And we can just see through to the house there where the pyrocanthus trained on the wall. And the horizontals again, the verticals, the horizontals, it draws you out through in these levels. And then to the left of that, you've got a couple of deciduous trees. We've got the, the wonderful corkscrew hazel. It's one of the biggest, biggest corkscrew hazels I've ever seen. It's um, Coralus avalana contorta. And, um, and to the left of that, with the sun coming through it, is, a, is actually a magnolia. It's magnolia cross superangiana valenii, which is a wonderful, wonderful tree. Um, it flowers for a long time. It's got these wonderful big pink flowers, but you having these deciduous trees in amongst the, the conifers, that's all part of that changing season and leafing up. And that's when I'm going to take you next is the deciduous part of the garden where it's a real contrast to just come through from the from the um from the conifers. I just want to show you a little bit more about the clipping of the, of the cedrus because I know this little question will get asked. Um we do it all by hand. Um and you can see it's in the waves there. Uh, it's the roughly the top level is just over five foot. And it's in these different tiers, um, and we do it. We do it by hand, um, just with with clip with with secateurs and snips. And we do one half um, mid September to October, and then we leave it for a week so that people visiting the garden can see the change. And then the following week, we do the other half. And the Friday volunteers that work in the garden um, got a big team of volunteers. They the Friday team love doing this, and this is Audrey and Mary doing it a couple of years ago. Um, so we'll move through now into that deciduous realm of the garden. And um, 
so many. The, the only one conifer in, in that you'll see in this picture is the one to the left side of the screen, which is running Hamia Lance Party, which is a Japanese fir. Um, really, really great tree. It's one of the few conifers that actually re sprouts from the base. So that's actually been coppiced many times. Um, and you can actually, if it gets too big for the space, you can cut it down, it'll throw up new shoots. So, very, very useful conifer because many of obviously when you cut them down, and um, that's it, that's it, they're gone. And I want to show you this picture because this goes through such a transformation. And um, we've got some different um, aces here. The one that's in the middle of the screen with the, with the twisted branches, Ace Aconitifolia. And I'll come to it in a second because it's probably my second favorite tree in the garden. And then um, this is the same room just a few months later. And we go from this is this is spring, so the daffodils are out. So this is probably late March. You know, the Tusia, the shortcut ferns are unfurling, and then boom, the shortcut ferns are in full flow, the gardens in full leaf, and this is where the real woodland treats. And the trees are a foil for the other things that are underneath it, and this this textural wonderfulness of of plants from all over the world. And one thing that I find really interesting about gardening and trees um, and shrubs is that. If trees have evolved in a very similar climate um, and at similar altitude, they will perform very, they'll have evolved in a very similar way. So if you take woodland plants from like North America, they work very well with things from, from China and from the Himalayas that are at the similar similar altitude. Or, or the difference in altitude and, and latitude um, can bring plants together. So for instance, where sort of 55 degrees north of the equator, you can take things that are that are close to the equator, but at higher altitude. So things from China that might be at 5,000 meters above sea level. So it's really, really interesting to me. Um, and this deciduous layer that you're getting here is just textural wonderfulness. We've got the it's Acer palmatum dissectum next to things like the Karengashoma and the, the Veratrums. And then you've got a plant from Japan next to a plant from North America. And, and this is the thing. And then behind that, we've got the stands of, of birches that are coming towards the end of their life and um and that's also the process in in a garden like it would be in a natural woodland is, is plants do have a they do have a, a an age limit and birch is being pioneer species meaning that when when there's clear ground they were the first thing to seed and they'll put the roots down and then other saplings will come through them and then they will they will fall and decay naturally and put life back into the into the soil so some of these trees that the spencers planted some 50 60 years ago or some of them 40 years ago, we're starting to drop limbs and, and that's when a garden needs to step in and we need to replant and plant for the next generation. Um, I'm going to show you something a bit a bit different now. Um, and this is actually the same. This is the Acer in the, uh, that you can see to the right side of the screen. I had a little bit of an accident in, um, in April and it, we had a very, very, very dry spring. And I was convinced that the frost would pass and I, I popped the sprinkler on, on the top of the tripod ladder in the garden and created Narnia basically. And this is this the Acer Aconite folium that I'm going to chat about in a minute. And I was completely, and you can see in the bottom of the picture there, the daffodils are frozen. Um, I'm sure some of you that are in different parts of the world will be very used to this. Um, but up in Yorkshire, this very rarely happens. And especially with with the water and then the free and then the freezing, so I basically just completely iced the whole of the dell, and um, and much to everybody's amusement, it turned into Narnia. And I was quite worried about some of the trees. Everything, nothing, nothing was damaged, and and I and I subsequently learned that in some of the orchards in France, they actually spray the blossom and the trees to freeze like this to protect them from constant frosts, and um, so. From from doing something that I thought was incredibly ridiculous and and, and I might have damaged the plants, I, I went on to learn other things and um, and I just thought it was a fun thing to share with you about about the trees. And um, so that tree that was in the last photo with all the ice on is the glowing red in the centre of the screen now, and it's it's the Acer Aconitifolia, and I got mad for this tree in the autumn, and for a number of reasons, um, it's one of the first trees to turn. Um, Euonymus misalatus compacted the wing spindle um, is the first shrub to go and then this is in a very similar colour it goes bang right in the middle of the garden and it works so well with with other plants and it's not just about the trees it's the way that they work with the understory and we've got this lovely this persicaria and plexicolis and and something behind it which actually is growing around a lot of car parks in England um, which is berberus 
And that darkly berberis, plants often get a really bad stigma for being used in, in multiple ways so that they all must become disposable or they become a meaningful planting. But when things are let to grow a bit more natural and they work with other plants, it works so well. And, and these dark tones, the reds and the purples and the darks are something that I'm very drawn towards. And I, every year since I've been here, I look forward to looking back towards ASX. I know that, and even when the leaves on the persicaria start to turn, you get these lovely contrasting colours. Um, and obviously, like like all good gardens, we clear all the leaves. Um, but I'm very, very sure with the other gardens that we do not blow the leaves from under the, the acer because they create this lovely kaleidoscope of leaves on the ground. Um, and you can see it there. This is just before the, the autumn leaves are starting to turn. You can see the red. Just the, if you look to the the left the left view sail, just above that, that's the acer, and that's the first one that's glowing before the beaches go, before the other acers go, and it's just got absolutely glowing red. Um, I think I popped a leaf in. Yes, yeah, so acer aconite for you. So if you want a great acer for your garden, this is my first choice. So it's closely followed by um, Sereu. Um, and just thought I'd throw in a few things that grow under this, just to show the sort of woodland plants. This is Glaucidium pot and this is from Hokkaido in Japan. And this plant takes seven years from seed to flower. Um, and I think that's why it's cherished so much amongst gardens. But to have these, these in the understory of the Aces um, is very special because it, it creates that sort of, it's not just creating a garden, you, you recreate in a little bit of, of nature um, and how it would be and um, I find that I find that fascinating and again everybody goes mad for for blue poppies them um, the Himalayan blue poppies the Mechanopsis and and the Primula in there that's Miller's Crimson um, which is the Japonica hybrid and and these are the things that are underneath the the deciduous woodland um, and it goes through that full cycle from from you come through the conifers you come into the deciduous woodland and that area is full of snowdrops as well um, in early in the year and then you get the flush of the leaves and you get the foliage and you get the woodland trees like this. So it's a really transitional room and many people say it's their favourite. And, and that's it with the snowdrops looking back in, in, in February. And the reason why I've come back this way and we're looking at the catkins on, on the, another native, which is the, the hazel, um, Corollus avalana. And this has been used, this was Robin Spencer, the son of the family that, that created this. Um, and I think this is genius gardening. Um, and it, and it, it uses so many different things that I, that I love as has been the way that we manage our woodlands and the way that we garden. Um, and it's under, it's under story and it's actually an, it's actually an archway and we'll, you'll see the arch in a second, but I want to not just show you the hazel, but the plants that are used under it. And this is um, this is this is the start of the year. This is in February, and this is Galanthus nivalis uh, S. Arnott, which is Samuel Arnott, which is a wonderful, wonderful, very vigorous snowdrop. Um, people go mad. I mean, I go mad for snowdrops as well. We've got a collection of about seventy snowdrops, but this one is probably for, for bang for your buck. This is the best snowdrop you can get, um, and it's it's very similar to your, your woodland Galanthus. It's naturalised all over the UK. It's not a native. Um, it was introduced many moons ago, but um, and it's naturalised only in places where people have inhabited. But this this was so Sybil Spencer bought three bulbs back in 1960 for, for three and sixpence. And that's old money, old English money. Uh, I think it's about 15, 15 and a half P, um, which would have been a lot more money back then. Um, and in modern modern days, they, so just from them three bulbs, the garden, there's thousands and thousands of this SR and they've been spread along this vista. Um, and that's the first layer under this, this coppiced hazel. Um, and then you get this wonderful species tulip. Um, this is Tulip Prison Fusilier. You can see the, the snowdrop leaves are, are going over and then you get this succession of tulips. And this is the vista down. And this is the arch that I wanted to show you. And this is very clever. Um, the woodlands in the UK, there's many hazel woodlands in the north of England that were copies for firewood and um, for bean poles and pea sticks. Um, and that that need for firewood and the need for woodland management um, has changed over the last hundred years or so. And many have gone into, many have been left to grow and you get these big stools and of, of overgrown hazel in woodlands. And people are starting to get back to the old ways. But this is a very similar principle. And the way that a coppice works is that, um, 
they cut right down um, in, in areas of the woodland and they let to regrow. And that could be in any number of years, depending on what the wood's going to be used for. But it might be in a five year rotation, it might be in a 20 year rotation. Um, but you can see on the, on, the first, on the first arch of this row that there's some very young whips to the side. Um, so periodically, we actually re replace one every year and you can see the one front left has got a bit gnarly and it's losing its shape. We can actually tie these in um, and you create this lovely walkway through. Um, and, it, and it's great because it, you snowdrops, your tulips, and then this is the little tulip closer up. Um, and this is what happens, it leaves over and it creates this wonderful canopy and shade in summer. Um, and that becomes a feature in itself. And we, we tie it in twice a year. And in that first, first photo I showed you, it had the lovely catkins on it. And um, we leave the catkins on for when we open in February for our snowdrop week. And then as soon as we close for snowdrop week, we tie them in. And it's all part of that theatre and, and use of the plant. And we, we can manipulate plants to, to be very, very artful in, in the garden, but still it's very similar values to what we used to do traditionally as, wood, as, as a woodland crop. So, there's a few different ideas that come together there and and you can see again if you look right down the centre of the photos that that's the arbor that's where we were stood before looking back towards the cedar so actually between us and uh, us and the end of the, the centre of the photo there the cedars on the other side of the wall so there's these hidden hidden gems and views and every single angle you look at in the garden cr creates this an, a, another amazing view and i just thought i'd pan back for a second And show you a bit of an overview of the garden and we've just come through for three or four rooms and just give you some perspective on on how the garden rooms work and where them sail where the sails are that we, we sort of circumnavigate and we're always looking back towards the sails and i think even the photo a couple of photos ago this is we're in the bottom corner of the of, of, the, of the aerial shot that i've just shown you and you get these glimpses and it's that that tie towards the use sails that that keeps you keeps you in New York gate and um, we're going to look at these sales next and we're going to look at the hedging and um I can't remember the figure that we've of, of, of hedging plants around the garden originally but there's two there's two main hedging hedgings around around the garden and at the bottom of the screen with the building um closest to the, what the computer is is beach so beach flags the garden on the bottom side and um, so actually the the boundary of the garden is, is beach and all the inner hedges are you um we clip we we'll clip the beach a lot of people clip the if you read the rhs it says to clip your, your beach hedges in july but they tend to put on a little bit more growth and i want them to hold the shape so we clip them a little bit later we clip ours in, in mid-august um, and that'll stop them putting on too much well they'll, they'll put very little growth before the winter and they'll hold that shape um People always ask about why beech holds their um, young and immature beech holds its leaves. So you'll see young beech trees that are unclipped that hold the leaves as well. And, and equally, that's basically what you do when you when you are clipping the beech every year. You you're keeping it juvenile, um, and that's why they hold the leaves. And that's what makes a great deciduous hedge because you can still get a solid barrier, um, an opaque barrier with a deciduous plant. And then when the new leaves push through, it pops all the all the old leaves. So great plants. So yeah, beech and you. Uh, if you're going to plant any hedges, beech and you are your two for me. I'm sure people will, will have their own ideas on that. And um, and this is this theatre again of the before and after. Um, I won't bang on about hedges too long, but it's a very important part of of the process. And um, this is the when people come towards the end of the season and, and we we clip these. It's it's so you can see how much growth it puts on the year, but it's so satisfying we cut the herbaceous layers down and get the clippers out and you, we take everything back to its structure um, and these hedges were renovated um about six or seven years ago and you can see the width of the, of the thinner hedges um you is so good because you can renovate it and that by that and then you can cut it hard back to the trunk and it'll re, it'll re-sprout um, and i'll show you something that we're going to do in the summer and, and the effects of it in a minute um, and it's this permanence and this as you as you've seen the herbaceous layers have cleared and this is in this is in the winter time and um, the garden would be nothing without the structure and the backbone and hedging trees again we're going to go back a few steps and and look at the garden in midsummer and and this is 
this is in the height of summer. This is June last year, and you can see the tree ferns there. I don't know where the tree the tree ferns classes are, are in the arb. Are they a tree? I mean, they're a fern. Are they a tree? We call them tree ferns. One of my favourite plants, so I threw them in there. And we actually got these bequeathed by um, a great, a wonderful, wonderful plantsman at a tropical garden in Leeds, Don. Um, and his sister kind of gifted these trees because they were sitting in the house. And, and, um, and we created this sort of homage to Don that was very forward thinking. It's, it's a tropical garden, but it's got this, it's a hardy, it's, I say it's tropical, it's a textural garden. It's, it's got things that were something we have to protect, but the tree ferns have done so well. And we, we've actually put a lot of watering system and they need this constant, constant water. Um, I spent a long time in New Zealand gardening and um, one thing that's very different and we think about them not being hardy is all the, all the tree ferns uh, that, we, that we have in our ornamental horticulture, we take all the old fronds off to tidy them up so we look so they look nice and tidy. In the wild, they just, the fronds bend down, they drop and they, they self-protect themselves. So any cold weather that they get protects the crown. Um, we take all that away and we wonder why they're not hardy. But what we do is we got jackets for them around the, around the crowns and we fleece and store into the, into the crowns and they've done incredibly well. Um, and I just, I just want to share them because they are such wonderful, wonderful plants, and they've got this, this air of the prehistoric world, the dinosaurs wandering through, and um, the children love this part of the garden. So back to the sales, um, and this is this is a view late summer. This is this is taken a couple of years ago, but it's it's very similar time of year to this. It's been a couple of weeks time, um, and if we were constantly clipped all the topiary, you wouldn't get this catching of the light. And that, that glow that you get from the new growth um, and the, the being backlit. And again, it's that seasonal change. We go to the, this is just a few weeks later before the leaves have dropped and we've clipped them tight. And this is just a, I want to talk a little bit about how we do it as well. And we've actually gone, we've gone nearly electric with all our kit. The, the, the technology's improved so much over the past past five or well, five to ten years with, with lithium batteries and they're getting lighter and they're getting better and they last longer uh, and the power that they can put through to the blades. I think the first wave of battery powered electric equipment was very um they, they didn't quite have the same umph as, as the petrol but we've uh, we, I'm very very keen to try new tools new technology and make life very easy for ourselves and, and, and make it more pleasurable to work in, not using big heavy machinery and not having covered in petrol petrol fumes. Um, and they give a very good result, as you can see. Um, and there's a little, everybody loves a snow pitch. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. So, a bit of renovation. Um, this is the backside of the use. And you can see there that you the path's very thin. Um, and we took the bullet. Got a garden committee where we make big decisions about the garden, um, and those of you that have renovated hedges will know this is completely fine. But yeah, we, we bit the bullet and we'll cut these hard back. And in June, we um, we started hacking back um, with a pair of loppers and um, and a little chainsaw, and we've taken these hard back under the trees. And I actually this photo I took on my way to this on my way to doing this talk, I um, put my phone out of pocket and I just wanted to show you. The, the Ren and What We Now were on the 1st of September. We did this in the first week in June. Um, and then it's already starting to generate from, from, the, from the base. And this is a, I'm just going to go back. This is really, really important um, as, a, as me as a custodian of the garden is that I make the next gardener's job easier. And, and these are big, it's going to take three or four years, five years for it to recover properly. But the access to the paths was poor. It's, it's not the, how it was originally designed and it was encroaching on the garden. And you've got to make these, these strong decisions and changes to make sure that the garden is, you know, by taking that back, you, you breathe a new life into the plant. And, and that's about the historical management of, um, of historic gardens and, and something that I'm very passionate about as well. So, yeah, hard back. This is the result. So really, really wonderful results. I'm very happy with that. Um, um, we've got a number of different beach in the garden. I struggled to get, I didn't have some really good photos of the beach in the garden. Um, you can see it just behind the, the plant cells there. You've got the, the, the two, the one in the top left hand corner is an ash, but the one to the right hand side of the building is a weeping beach. And then you've got the, the stranded beach. And um, when I first, when I first started yoga, I was, I was unaware of the different cultivars and forms, but 
there's a number of different beaches that we have in the garden. We've got the, the cut leaf um, copper beach, which is Fergus Rohanii. We've got the big Dowick beach, which I talked about before, the Doik beach, um, which is a part of the garden to the Edinburgh Botanics, um, which is a very fastidious form. It looks like a Lombardy poplar. We've got the copper beach. We've got the weeping copper beach. We've got the normal weeping beach. We've got the standard Fergus Sylvatica. And, and all together, the career, you can you can stand in the Pine and you can see these different beaches around. And I don't know whether the Spencers did it intentionally, but they really... I don't know whether they flute it or whether they plant it, but you can see all these different beaches from around the garden and it's just how clever that they can use it. Um, so yeah, that's beach. And um, this bit now is, this is Deadwood. And I wanted to talk more, going back to that coppiced hazel, this is, I'm very proud of this fence. Um, I'm going to sh show you why we've done it and how we've done it. And it's actually, the, the uprights there um, are something that's not, it would not grown in this part of the country, it's grown more in the south, which is sweet chestnut. And I've, we've used sweet chestnut uprights for this fence because and it lasts much longer than the hazel. But I'm very keen on teaching traditional uh, traditional skills and, and part of the ethos of the arts and crafts and the part of the way that we use the wood is is really important and it's what I teach our trainees. And this is Jeff Norton. He He's, he's called himself the Yorkshire, his Yorkshire hurdles, and he makes he makes hurdles from scratch usually. And I approached him about doing um, a woven fence and stitch, and we came up with this between us that we would use. Uh, well, to say we, he came up with the idea we we're going to actually use cleft sweet chestnut, and we we decided that we'd use round sweet chestnut, and then put hazel weavers in between. And these long lengths of hazel are about 10, 12 foot long, um, a bit thinner than a bean pole. And they're on a continuous weave. And, and Jeff came to, he, we got him in to teach for two days. Um, and it's a, it's a great skill. I've, I've done woven fencing before, but we've taught the whole team. And this is all locally coppiced hazel. And this is the fence in action. And it's a pleasure to do. And it's a great job from the depths of winter once the, once the hazel's been coppiced. Um, and I, this is the strongest fence. I mean, it's stronger than any fence you will ever buy. You could drive a bus against this and it'd be absolutely fine. And actually, looking back to when we used to build forts, this is the way that they would have done it. They built these solid fences with, with coppiced wood. Um, so this is the this is the process that we go through. And this con you, you go from end to end and this continuous weave. So with the with the thick with the butt of the the, the, the the branch and you weave left to right and then right to left, and you work along this wonderful. And you see it build up across the day, and um, that thing that's lying on the ground there that I made is a is traditionally called a beetle, um, which is like a big wooden hammer, and you use you use the same wood that you are um, that you're working with. So actually, it's to do with the the, the hardness of the bark and the um, and the abrasions on it. So you actually do very little damage to the to the wood that you're using. So you use that you have very tight fence, and you hammer down with the beetle, and it gets this very tight woven fence in the the more you put in and the more you press it down, you can jump, you can jump up and down on this fence to, to get it solid. It's just the strength in it is absolutely mind-blowing. Um, and these are the tools that we use. We use the, the pruning saw, the beetle, the, the loppers and, and, and the secateurs, and um, you get this very, very tight finish. Um, and I've integrated this fence around around the nursery, um, which is I think I think lovely. Um, and the re the reason why I've sort of got ahead of myself here, the reason we were doing this fencing is I've put an extension on the garden and um, that's great. That's a new design. It's, it's an addition. So we've got a new cafe, a new plant center and new parts of the garden. And, and these were, I wanted to show a bit more of the industry side of delivering the, um, the beach. And these came from Deepdale and I was absolutely over the moon with the quality and they come root ball. The, the wire root balls, they've got hessian. These were lifted, um, they're wrapped with hessian and then they're wrapped with wire. Um, there's various debates on whether people plant with the wire on. Obviously, the roots, the, the hessian will naturally rot, um, and then then the roots grow through. We we actually um, we did a went half halfway house. We sort of clipped the upper the upper wire off so that we could plant around the base, plant things like snowdrops. But these are beach columns, and uh, this truck was absolutely blew my mind because they had this, this wonderful wagon where they could bring the top off and then they, it had a, an inbuilt arm and it was it was per, exactly purpose-built for, for this job, for, for moving trees in Topia River. 
Um, and these are all the things how gardens are built, which is which I think is just important as, as building the garden itself, if not more important. So this was the beach coming off, um, and this is the new garden. And you can see where we've we've built, we've not even built the fence yet. We got the, the beach in position. And the evolution of the new part of the garden, and this is this is my bit of legacy that I'm leaving behind in the garden, um, that will hopefully be here for many, many moons, like the like the original garden that we've just come from. Um, and this this use of wood, and you look back at the building there, and it's got shingle, it's got a wooden shingle, it's all larch, it's larch shingle and larch um, larch blackboard blackboards, um, and the structure of the posts are oak. Um, so all stuff that's grown in the UK. So these these permanent again it's about that permanence so the herbaceous planting that goes around it will be very seasonal but the beach will hold its character in the winter with the dead leaves and then it'll come to flush and stuff and this is i just want to give you a picture of the evolution and this this literally this started um this was in february this year february march so we finished the fence the beach has gone in and you can see the the hazel uprights lean up against the hut for sale, so we sell them for people growing vegetables and beans and plant supports. And this lovely picture down, sir, this continuous, it's all about the backbone of the garden, whether it's the hard landscape and it's the hedges, it's the topiary, it's the trees, um, and you should be able to go into any great garden 12 months a year and find beauty and design and structure. Um, and then you get there. As the season unfolds, it's it more exciting. Um, and this is this is it a few months on. This was a, a few weeks ago before it started to come into into full flow. And you've, you've got this beach head at the front and the beach columns and the herbaceous layers, and it all ties together. Um, and over the years, it will become more mature and, and blending with the garden. And um, so it's really the the new and the old sort of working together and taking similar principles from the garden and reusing them. Um, and this is. Um, I wanted to mention Leeds coppice workers. Um, I'm sure some of you that are in the UK will be aware of the different coppices that are around the country. Um, and they, 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 they're a cooperative. Um, now that they they actually look after a lot of the, so we're in Leeds in, the, in, in Yorkshire in the north of England, and they manage different woodlands that belong to the council, the wildlife trust, that, that were no longer managed. They were going to, they were overrun with deer, there were all sorts growing in there and they were getting quite un untangled and tidy. And they've gone through and they're renovating all these different, we call each section of the coppice And they're bringing them back so you get these dead straight rods um, and they're nearly on a full cycle now. They're working their way around various woodlands and they don't take any, they don't get paid a wage for, for doing this, but whatever they take out of the wood, whether that's firewood, they make charcoal, these are the bean poles, and the, the, hazel, the hazel pea sticks just behind them. These are all the old ways of doing things. And many, many gardeners, veg gardeners use bamboo that's been imported. Um, and I'm a massive advocate for growth, for using hazel, hazel stakes in the garden. These are they're used for all manner of things, for hedging stakes, um, for hedge laying, which is another traditional craft skill. Um, obviously, like I mentioned, the beans and the, the, the pea sticks we actually use for making um, peony baskets. So we, we weave them when they're still soft, when they've been coppiced early in the year. If you get them in before sort of April, they're still very malleable and you can create these lovely baskets. It's very arts and crafts and plants will grow up through them and be supported. So there's a number of different things in this, this real craft gardening that that I want to, to live, live on in British horticulture. And this is... We sell sort of 150, 200 packs of these to, to locals that come and to come. So we, we're an outlet for the Leeds Coppice Works. So if anybody is looking for these craft products, if you go online and um, I think it's Coppice Workers UK, you can put in your post and you will find your local coppice workers um, and where you can get these, these traditional products from. And that is, it's all part of bolshevik industry and that's arboriculturalists. Um, and, and gardeners and veg growers, market gardeners, all working together, and it's all perpetuating, which is great. Um, I've not got many slides left, um, but I wanted to show you my little my little baby. This is a little project and something slightly different. Um, and this is this is this is the, the front of the house where we were just at the back where the new plant center is. And this is um, this is how it was when I arrived. Um, and we created this new master plan for a new garden and a new entrance to the garden, which is very, very different to the previous garden. And I spent a lot of time in Andalusia. And 
the, the bit that excites me the most is the derelict olive groves. It's not the rolling, rolling fields always. I think that's amazing and amazing landscape. But it's these little pockets, small olive groves, and the bulbs that grow in there, and the species daffodils, and the irises, and the arums, and the different aroids. Um, and I want to, I've used local sandstone from a quarry about a mile up the road. And there's these mature olives. Um, I'm sure we're going to get questions about import things, but these olives were in quarantine for three years. Um, before they went into this into this sand and um, it's a sand garden there's two and a half foot of sand there's um, onto the subsoil there's no there's no topsoil in there um, and it's a very forward for me a forward thinking way of gardening the climate's changing um, rapidly um, and this is very very drought tolerant and it's very um, flood it's, it, it, it copes with flood as well so the sand's a very very free draining medium um, you can't grow everything in there, but it's amazing what grows in there. And we can get away, we can push the hardiness barriers. And you can see in the middle, right in the middle of the screen, there's an agave. Um, nobody, not many people grow agaves outside in Yorkshire. But it's that free drain. They don't like the winter, the winter wet, but with that free draining medium, we can, we can grow things that we, we couldn't usually grow. And again, a lot of things that grow in alpine houses, some of the more unusual crocuses and some more unusual bass that I've mentioned from the med from Spain. They grow very, very well in this medium and, and it mimics more like they grow in the wild. Um, but the, this was us putting them in and it was a great process. And th this, I've put these pictures in just because it, 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 it remind, it's a really special time when we planted this garden up. And we actually took an awful lot of soil off the root ball so that the they plants react very differently to growing in a, in a free draining medium that's low in nutrients to actually put out. They put roots in a different way. They won't, they won't hug to that pot shape that many, I'm sure many of you have bought plants and planted them. And they stay in that pot shape because they're used to that environment. Well, by by almost being very rough with them, and they sold for they sold for a year, we put them in. And um, they will put out their root systems into that natural into that environment where they should be rather than staying in that pot shape. And we do it with our perennials and where we can with plant bare root. And um, so that plants, whether that's trees or fish, get this association. So that's um, that's putting them in, and then this is them going in, and now we've got this amazing, this amazing garden that's just all sorts of wonderful things. And this area is now full of echiums that are a couple of years old, and oh, well, they're in their second year. They got through a harsh winter, um, and this is it. Just a couple of days ago, this is Anamanthella lasoniana, which is a um, pho pheasant's grass, which is from New Zealand, um. And we mix these different layers and it's all about this dry garden planting um grasses and agaves and olives and then the real shows in the spring when all the, the wonderful Mediterranean bulbs come up so it's a real little project to find and i'm really happy with it so far and um be interesting to see other plants come in a couple of years time when the nutrient levels drop even more um, but that's all that's all the fun of gardening is the is the play i just want to show you that um and all, just on the opposite side of where the new hedging's gone in and uh, and a little bit about plant things, not putting things in too big. Um, it's these again. These are root ball view that were that were planted in in February March, um, at, right at the end of the of the bare root season, really. Um, start small, and eventually that will be a six to seven foot hedge. And where Jack is in the middle, there there'll be a big arch view, and that'll be the new entrance to the garden. So you've seen the old garden, the maturity that's over there. That's flourished over the last 70 years this is this is the next part of the garden um so i hope you enjoyed um this little whirlwind of a chat this is the view the new the new entrance to the garden that will will flourish over the coming coming years um i'm back at the front gate so i'm sure you've got lots of questions um and the reason why i've talked about this wonderful garden um it's because it serves a very important purpose now, um, which is the charity perennial, which is who I work for. And perennial is, um, Helen will explain what perennial does, but perennial is uh, is the charity for horticulturalists and um, supporting horticulturists and their families. And three gardens have been bequeathed to this charity. York Gate was the first in 1994. Um, is the Fuller's Mill, which is in Suffolk which is Bernie Tinkner's garden, and just January this year, we, we received Savoy Strong's garden, which is the last gift. And these are a tool for spreading the word of the charity, and um, and that's where I'm going to leave it, and it, let Helen explain what, what we do as a charity. 
Thank you very much, Ben. That was absolutely brilliant. And uh, yeah, I, uh, as I said, I've been making people jealous in the chat, but I got to go around the gardens having a tour from Ben. And as soon as we got to the end of the tour, I immediately asked him if he'd do a webinar for us because I thought I've got to make all you lot really jealous about what I've just seen. So ha <laughs> ha. Um, we will come to questions at the end. But now, thank you very much, Helen. Over to you. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm doing a whistle top tour of what perennial does. So hopefully it's not not too quick. So um, perennial is uh, is what's called a benevolent fund. So we are a type of charity, but we only help people of a certain occupation. So for us, it's anybody who works in the horticultural industry. So that is. Um, yourselves arborists it's foresters it's every single aspect of the industry um you don't have to be hands-on if you work within the industry in the office you, you qualify for our support it also means that it's for your family whether you work and you can no longer work because of ill health or retirement or you're not well so we work on very different aspects some of it is very challenging and is very challenging to the people who come to us for support. We support people with life-changing events um, and we're here to over, help them overcome those issues. But also we're here to give advice and support and information, which is all private and free and confidential. And during COVID particularly, this was the key area that we provided the most support on, keeping people up to date, knowing what they could do, especially in those first um, few months, particularly here in the UK anyway. So what we do here in Perennial is we look at providing um, support, advice and solutions. So we have um, a team who provide immediate and advice and information. So you could literally email in, make a phone call, and you would get the advice that you want and the information sent through to you. We also have a team who give more bespoke support. So that can be quite short term, maybe a few days, maybe a few weeks. It can be very long term for some people. You know, life comes along and keeps hitting them, keeps getting to them. Um, but also, you know, life can be quite drastic when something goes not to plan. So sometimes it's long term and we mean years. We will be there to support somebody. We support the individuals and their families. But we also work on preventative support because we don't want to be the sticking plaster help. We actually want to have long term support. Let's help with what the issue is at the moment, but also let's look at what can we do to improve things? What can we do to support you? And actually, the best result for us is that actually somebody doesn't need us again because they've got to the best place they possibly can. So we're all about building and creating better futures. And that's one of the things that we work with, particularly with the perennial partners and the traders associations like, like yourselves. So giving preventative support. So for instance, during um, the height of lockdown, we did a lot of webinars and workshops around recognizing um, stress within your workforce, what to do, how to support them um, and so forth. So we have a team, we have a nice, wonderful team. So we have a helpline team who are there and they literally do answer the questions as people come in through the doors, um, which of course virtual at the moment. We have a casework and debt team, which develop the support for the individuals because we're all separate, we're all individuals, we all have different needs and that we need to work with. So the casework team look at all kinds of different aspects. So it can be increasing income because somebody's just retired or somebody's on um, a low wage, somebody's separated, maybe become homeless, housing, bereavement, ill health. But it can also be job insecurity and redundancy. And then we've got the debt team who do more around making savings, money matters, and also more in debt work as in court representation and bankruptcy but then we also have the more preventative inputs so training supporting people's careers so i'm doing a quick whistle stop of some of the things that we do not all of them but just some of them so one of the most important things that we've been dealing with over the last 18 months is taking care of health and well-being for the last 12 months 
it's everybody coming in to our service. We always ask, we try to find out what the reason is they're coming through to us and what that issue is, what's the reason that they've got that issue. And for the last 12 months, well over 60% have been around health, whether that be physical health or mental health. So we've, we were working on this before lockdown, but we've really increased that upper gear. So now we're looking at how we can assist in the moment, how people can get support and how can people can get back into control of their lives. But also we're looking at how to increase more preventative measures going forward, which I'll explain in a moment. So one of the things that we do with some of our um, workshops around recognising stress in your workforce or in yourself or your friends or your family is knowing what those symptoms are. So I'm sure a lot of you will just know that you, people say they're stressed, they've got stress headache or they get stomach problems and that maybe they're getting difficulty concentrating. But did you know all of those are also symptoms of stress? That people drinking too much and smoking too much, also probably something you knew about. But being irritable and snappy and constantly worrying and being forgetful are all key signs of stress. And they are things to, to note in, in yourself, in your colleagues and people that you work with. And what we try and work with is looking what the cause is. Why do people get stressed? What are they worrying about? One of the key things that the team does is somebody, you know, people struggle to open up and explain what they're worrying about. Not everybody, but some people do. And often it's the thing that they wake up about in the middle of the night. So it can be worried about work, worrying about retirement, it's pressure at work at the moment. Here in the UK anyway, it, there's a real boom time in all aspects of horticulture. And people are trying to keep up on top of that work all the time while um, goods are being delayed, while they can't get hold of staff. And a lot of people realise that this may not come, carry on. Who knows what's going to happen this time next year? There's also issues around family, relationship difficulties, caring for somebody, divorce, people worrying about bills, people worrying about that they've got no money to pay the bills, or worrying about things on lines of how do I save for a deposit on a house or a child going to university. And then, of course, there's health illness, losing someone, an injury, which is a key thing that we do deal with. And one of the things that we looked at was being able to provide support for people to use without having to contact us for help, so they can just go on our website and just click on and use it. And at the moment, we're using what's called Together All. This is an online mental health wellbeing tool that's totally free. It's, it's completely controlled and monitored by um, mental health professionals. People can download courses, can have conversations, can pick up on courses about why they're feeling stressed, how to sleep better, how to cut down on smoking or drinking. But earlier on in the year, we did um, a poll, a survey, wanting to know more about what people were concerned about within the industry. And it was very key that it came through to us that the information that we gathered and we got nearly 50% above what we expected to get back, was that people were very interested in, in physical health, in keeping their blood pressure down, in, the, in exercise, of making sure, yes, they were still interested in mental health, but it was the whole thing of looking after themselves. Perhaps this is something that's COVID has, has kept us interested, interested in. So now we're working on providing more than this, of being able to provide an app that within it you will get met, people will be able to access totally free mental health support, direct through to counselling, but also through to a digital gym to um, exercise packages for what people need, to knowing how to your blood pressure numbers, your cholesterol numbers, and maybe a healthy diet, all different things. So a lifestyle choice more than a well-being. And this is what we've been asked for and this is what we're trying to provide. People can still get direct counselling, but it's just a more of a wider spectrum of the support that we can provide. So one of the other things that people can access is physio service. Here in the UK, anyway, everything's been very much on hold. Physios are starting to be a bit more um, working again. However, if you're trying to get it from the NHS, you can be working, you can be waiting for quite some weeks, if not months. 
And this physio service is really particularly aimed at people who've got that niggle, that pull, so you can get the support immediately, literally within days, so it doesn't become anything worse. So you can carry on working, so you're not working with an injury, which then you know can be exacerbated and may lead to you not being able to work at all. So the whole key thing is about being a people being able to access support that they need straight away, not having to worry about can I work, can't I work, or making it worse. And it is literally just you know a phone call into us. We can access it, refer you through. People get a phone call assessment. Then, depending on the level of what they require, is they will either get um, exercises bespoke for them, sent through to them, or they will be referred through to a physio within their local um, region so they can access um, physio support, over which we um, do look at paying for if that person isn't able to get that. The initial part is totally free. Another area that we've increased as well is employment supports. So we can do the full employment support program. So this is a six month program where people get a career coach. This is particularly used by people who know they have to change their career. Who have to look, know they can't carry on physically doing the career that they're doing. And it is a commitment, but we pay for it and it takes people through to the other side. And we've had really good success rates with it, with people going on to get different jobs and quite successfully. We also provide um, numerous fact sheets. So it can be steps to guys on job seeking, on convincing covering letters, tips for preparing for an interview, the types of questions you get asked now at interviews, effective CV writing and how to find a job. We had a lot of people in the middle of last year who were made redundant and hadn't looked for employment for 20 plus years. And they used to get the newspaper and go through the jobs or, or look through Port Week or very other magazines. Well, now it's, it's online. It's very different. So lots of tips and support around that as well. We also provide varying support around um, money matters. So... On our website, we've got lots of self-help self tools. So there's um, a money diary, budgeting tools, tips for managing money. And these are for varying things. It doesn't mean to say you're using them because you're in debt. So people just need to give their finances a spring clean. It may be that you are looking to save for something. It may be looking that you're actually wanting to work less hours, that you want to start um, moving towards working less. So they're all things that people can access themselves. It's totally free. The budgeting tool is, is quite, is works out very bespoke to yourself. So it doesn't give generalist information. It will give if you're just yourself and you're a man with a dog, it will only get asked you questions about, you know, anything to do with your dog and, and yourself. It won't ask you any questions about children, for instance. And then it will give you tips and ideas and links to websites to be able to, um, get further additional information then we can also help people review their finances in a more detailed way so they can work with a caseworker to look at can we increase your income so they might be entitled to in work um, benefits because they've got a young family or it might be that we discover that actually their tax code is incorrect and we can get that help them get that sorted we can also look at um, financial ability. So this is something we're, we're nearly finished working on a webinar on, uh, just supporting people of how to save, just some tips. We can come, become quite complacent about how we look after our money. But also the debt team can help people if they do have debt repayments. Some people haven't come out, come out of COVID too successfully financially. So that particularly is something that we can help with. And then we also can work with bespoke support. So all our debt advisors are licensed and qualified financial conduct um, advisors, and they work with a plan with the person. So what is best for them? And that person makes the choice. So it can be whatever is best. And they're given numerous scenarios and what the effects are and how that will establish them and what their path forward would be. And then we can work with them to move them forward with that. 
We also have a free legal helpline service, which um, is supported by Erwin Mitchell, and they're available 24-7, seven, seven days a week, and that's available for the horticultural community within the UK. So England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, they support people around employment issues, tenancy issues. We still have a lot of people with tired accommodation, that's service occupancies, um, housing issues, separation, creating a will, probate, accidents at work, which uh, so I've got to tell you are our main people who use that, particularly self-employed ones, and, and a lot more. We have had people last year who rang and used our legal helpline because they were informed a tree didn't have a preservation order and then when it was taken down they discovered it did and they were able to support them with that. It was a self-employed, I mean it was absolutely terrifying for him as I'm sure you can all imagine. So Perennial has a website that actually, you know, for all of you could use if you wanted to, the definitely the mental health and well-being, the budgeting tools are available to you all. Um, but it's advice and information that's there to use. It's around finances, mental and physical well-being. There's lots of advice and information on there. We still update regularly anything to do with um, COVID and the restrictions here in the UK and each individual country within the UK and um, different aspects of that. We've got advice and support around welfare benefits, advice and support, which is particularly used for people who are no longer able to work, ill health, low income children. Social care, housing, legal, we go on self-employed, training, careers, physio, there's, there's a lot we support with. So John particularly asked me to give you a case today. Um, and we, we, have, we have two, I have two for you. So one's quite dramatic and one is more what I would call everyday life. So we got a call from, from the brother of an ab who, was, who had had a quite traumatic accident a couple of years ago and he was airlifted to hospital. He had fallen from a tree while holding his chainsaw. He was self-employed and subcontracting. He was very, very concerned. He knew he did have insurance. However, he knew if he wasn't working, he wasn't going to get paid and it would take some time before things could get sorted out. So we arranged to visit him and talk to him. The main reason we, we, we went to visit him rather than do it on the phone is that his, his, one of his limbs, one of his arms had to be sewn back on and he wasn't able to use it. He didn't have internet where he lived, well he did, but he was so rural that it was, it was very poor connection. So to be able to listen and to talk, and he was, as you can probably imagine, extremely stressed and anxious of what his life would be, because it had totally changed of what he thought it was going to be for at least the next 20 years. So we supported him making all the phone calls, helping him with which forms had to be completed, which if any of you have been through any form of injury or insurance, you know the amount of paperwork that is always requested. And we managed to make sure the money was coming in so he could pay his mortgage. We then made sure that he got care and support within the house to make sure that he didn't have to ask his brother to come round to help him in and out of the bath because he couldn't get in. The accident had also affected one of his legs as well. And we got that support in. We supported him gathering evidence to be able to give to um, his solicitor. We supported him also to be able to get some retraining and some careers advice so he could look forward and start planning for the future. We also were able to access him counselling because it was a traumatic event. I mean, as I'm sure you can all imagine, it was a very traumatic event. Within this period, he, he, his marriage broke down because of the continuous anxiety and stress of not knowing what was going to happen, how it was going to happen, how would they survive, the stress, as you can, as you can imagine. He now has a new career. He's working well. He's him and his wife are, are back together. Their relationship is strong, and he literally doesn't need us anymore. Um, and that is the best result for us 
We were there for him when he needed us in the time of need. And now he doesn't need us anymore. He says he doesn't know where he would have been without our support because he just didn't know where to turn. And it was very difficult for him to ask for help. And if it hadn't have been for his brother ringing us because he knew of us, he probably wouldn't have asked for help until he absolutely had to. The other person I'd like to tell you about is somebody who also had an accident, but it wasn't quite as traumatic. And he just couldn't work for a few weeks because he wasn't well. But he had real problems with his employer paying him his sick pay. And it literally took us a few phone calls, um, one for him to work with Mitchell, one for us to give him some information to send to his employer. And he literally got it all sorted out within no time whatsoever, within less than a week. It took us it took us minutes to be able to give him the advice and support, but then him just feeling confident going forward of what he had to say, what his rights were, and what he could do. Both have significant impact upon that person, as you can tell, very different. One person we worked with for less than a week, the other person we worked with for nearly 18 months. So John particularly asked me to um, let you know about some of the preventative support that we can provide for um, trade associations. The AB Association is, is a perennial partner. So within that package, um, you receive emails with regular updates of what's happening, what's going on, new initiatives that we're doing. We do provide different workshops and webinars for staff but also for trade associations. We can make those very bespoke, depending on your staff or what you, want to pre what you want to be able to provide. We provide interactive workshops. So some can be recorded for them to just jot down the information they want to know. They can stop it and start it whenever they want to. But some are more where they can ask questions the whole way through and they can query. So we look at all of that. One of the other things that we also do is we have um, focus groups where we ask members of the industry to help feed in to what we're looking at doing. So it might be that we're looking at certain areas of support we would want to provide, but we want input from the industry because we want to make sure we get it right. Are we considering the right things? Are we heading in the right direction? So one of the things we were looking at was additional support around um, mental health. And uh, we had some discussions with, with a few um, perennial partners and nearly 100% of them asked about um, mental health first aiders within the industry. So that's one of the things that we're now going to be looking at. Um, so these are really supporting for us. We want to make sure we're providing what is needed, what is helpful, what is wanted so it's it's literally a few moments of somebody's time um if possible and if people can't attend they can still send a quick email just to give their input around a certain subject of whether it is useful or not and actually we'd rather know that it's a complete load of rubbish and to just park it and carry on with it one of the other things we do is we do do presentations at meetings. This one is a complete whistle stop, as you can tell. But we do ones about, as I said, um, help and support for your staff that on average takes about 40, 45 minutes. We can support managers to support the staff, the supervisors, but then we can come back from a completely different angle of the, the staff themselves. We're also doing the ones of um, financial ability, looking at... Um, making sure your money's working for you right. We can also help if um, you've got anybody who's a carer or is about to retire and isn't too sure about how they're going to retire and what they're going to do. Okay, so if you think any of your staff or anybody may want help, you just, we're there. Look on our website, send them through. We're only here, we're here to help. That's, that's, that's what we do. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Helen. That was great. Um, 
Yeah, that was a good whistle stop. And uh, it's really good. Like uh, you've already said this, but um, to everyone out there watching, if you want to find out more, as Helen said, that was a whistle stop. But there's ways of going into more detail about different things on another occasion, if you if you like. And it is such a great charity. And it's, we're, we're very proud of the association that for, for many years we've, we've supported and worked with from Perennial. And I'm hoping we'll be able to do more stuff uh, in the future together, starting with this uh, webinar. So brilliant. Okay. Questions. What have we got? It's twenty. Look, it's time. Is time has just flown by. We'll we'll rattle through a few questions. Um, I'm not going to have time to ask all of them, uh, but as always, we'll send the whole list of questions to our speakers uh, afterwards, and then they can have a look at them. And if you've got any questions to follow up, you can email me, John at trees.org.uk, and I shall make sure the questions get to the right place. Um, Okay, we do have a slight imbalance in questions towards people wanting to find out about the gardens, uh, Helen. So please don't don't take that it's the wrong fine. way. I was expecting it. Ben, ben, ben has such glossy photos of topiary. <laughs> um, so let's see. A few people really interested in the uh, the cedar, uh, Ben. You've got the. Um, yeah. So uh, we've got, sorry, I'm just flicking around here. Maneeb was saying it appears to be in, a, in an espalier style. So the, that cedar, which is just an amazing thing to see. When I was there, I was really blown away by that. Uh, Sophie, is, oh, sorry, go on. It is espaliered, yeah, is the answer to that. Yeah, it's, um, so it's, it's taken, you have to let, at a young age, you have to let the tree grow up a little bit and train them at 45s, and then you gradually train the branches down as you would with, a, as you would with an apple tree. It, it really is it's a remarkable thing. Um, Sophie's asked, uh, why do you choose to trim it by hand? Um, why not? It, it's um, it's it's part of the um, it's part of the process as well. Um, it doesn't take us in that long, and we do it as a team. So there's usually three or four of us do it together, and it takes it takes us three, two, three, four hours uh, first week, two, three, four hours the second week, and it also means that if you clip if you're clipping. Um, you get a lot of needle drop and you get a lot of congestion in the plant. Um, and by clipping it by hand and taking it all off by hand, you, you stop that that detritus collecting in amongst the in amongst the branches. But it's um it's not a big job when you do it together. And it also we get such enjoyment out of doing it as a cultural process together that um that's why we do it by hand. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a real sort of showstopper, isn't it? Um, another question while we're on the on the cedar and on the toe another question from uh, the need. Um, who's asking, is, has there been any change in the style and the ratio of topiary management over the years for these plants in the UK? Um, I guess the style's quite interesting there. Is this, is yeah. this a, are we seeing the same thing as we've seen for a long time? Are there changes in the topiary world? It depends on the in the innovation of the garden, I suppose. Um, obviously, as a, as a whole, we take a lot of our ideas from the sort of Italian Renaissance um, and some of the French gardens and Op gardens and the size. And um, it's... The, the majority of, of topiary in the UK is box and is box and you. Um, there's been some real problems with box. I'm sure a lot of people are aware. We've we've not got the the moth box moth this far north, but we we do have blight. Um, and I mean personally, I wouldn't plant box in um, in the garden now uh, unless there, there's better strains coming out. But at the minute, I think there's other there's other options, and we're looking. People are using alternatives, linicerous and tucreums and. Um, Pittsburgh golf ball seems to be the popular one at the minute, but they, they never they're trying to do something that, that can't quite be matched in my eyes. Um, but yeah, but the same styles and the, the spirals and the balls and the repetition and the shapes is is very. It it does change. I think something that is changing at the minute is you you saw the pillars, the beach pillars I was putting. That's quite popular amongst the Tom Stewart Smith plantings and. You went to the new RHS Bridgewater. So there's definitely trends and styles, but they seem to sort of recirculate. And then you get one offs like the cedar. Um, and the reason why you don't see many of them is because they take time and we're impatient beasts. Um, and the more time that you the more time that you give something like that, we're actually training them. Um, I didn't show it, I didn't get a picture. We we train um those in a, a Zara macrophyla. Um, really cool tree um, that gives off an amazing, the flowers are very insignificant and it gives off the most amazing scent and then it can be very, the scent can be picked from somewhere different in the garden and we're actually fan training one of them on the, the other end gable um, that's on the cafe end, um, which is going to take years and years, um, you know it's going to take another 30 years for it to look any good but 
um, it will be so worth it when it is. Um, so everyone's got to go and visit now and then go back in 30 years, is what you're saying. You've got to see it all the way through. Um, I would recommend doing that. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Ben. Um, okay, question for Helen. We'll just kind of jump around as we go, if that's okay. Uh, question from Anthony. Uh, Anthony saying that you must, uh, in the nature of your work, you must meet a lot of people who've suffered sort of physical damage and need help. Um, how do you get those people sort of uh, off the tools almost into less physically stressful and damaging work? Do you do you sort of facilitate people to use arboriculture, for example, people who've had accidents on the tools as tree surgeons? Do you offer routes for them to then move into perhaps consultancy work or tree officer work or that sort of side of things? It's very much up to them. Unfortunately, we get at least half a dozen every year, every year. And I've been here 20 years and literally every year we'll get at least half a dozen. So it's very much up to that person. Some people actually know exactly what they want to do. So I know at least one person who actually we supported and he went back to, um, he retrained and is now, I um, can't think of the right name. He works for the Forestry Commission and drives around and, and all the rest of it and, and checks and everything. But some other people will completely want to retrain, but just don't know what they want to do. And that's why we have the employment support and they can have six months of careers advice. So basically they talk to them about what their interests are, what they like to do. And then they will start looking about what kind of jobs encompass those interests. So it's not just having to think of a job. It's like, think back when you were 15 or 16 and somebody asked you what you want to do for a living. You haven't got a clue, have you? Or maybe you want it to be, you know, something, somebody famous or whatever. But So it's very bespoke service. So they get all kinds of tips. They will get the training. We, we pay for additional training as well when needed. Um, so we can support people, yes, who just cannot carry on in more physical jobs. And that includes people who are in um, wheelchairs as well. Thank you. Helen. I should say, Anthony also said, uh, nice to have met you at various Southeast branch and other AA events, by the way. So, <laughs> I do get about, I've been around, I'm, I'm very old. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, okay. I'm going to try and sort of pull two questions slightly together here for you, Ben, um, uh, which I've lost. So uh, Ian has asked, about when you're planting for the next generation, are you taking any pressures, any measures to mitigate the pressures that might occur due to climate change and plant diseases? Now, I think you slightly answered that with the, the Mediterranean garden at the front, but perhaps you might want to tell us a bit more about. But on a similar kind of theme, question from Dominic, who's asking about whether or not you use local plants and trees or if you have exotic ones as well. And again, I know you've clearly shown you've got exotic ones, but it's a big issue in arboriculture, native versus non-native, do you face those kind of debates in your work? Yeah, we do. And it's it's um obviously I imagine they're very similar questions that we ask ourselves. Uh in obviously my my real passion is perennials. Um and the 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 constant or me, uh, meadows, should I say rather than perennials, but there's a real big debate over meadows, native meadows and non-native meadows. And and actually the research, the scientific research that's been done is that biodiversity in general is is more important than native sometimes and when we get very hung up on the fact that um native is native is everything but actually biodiversity is everything um or some my beliefs are um, and my my thoughts have changed a lot um i think looking to europe and and, and the cultural ways that we do things um they're there to be changed and they're there to be challenged and we often do things just because they've been done before um, and you have to go out and learn for yourself. So I'm starting to change my views. And, and I think native is great, but adding non-native is also is also good um, and can add a lot of, it can add flowers in the winter months um, for, for, for insects and things like, for instance, take ivy. We, we never cut our ivy back until till really late in the season, so early in the year, so that because the ivy produce a lot of flowers. Um, that sort of on warmer days, our honey, we've got bees on site, they all collect the nectar um, late in the year when there's little when there's little else in flower. Um, so yeah, so it's a real good question. But yeah, we do mix natives and non-natives. Um, obviously I love I love planting natives as well. Um it, but it's um it's not so one thing to do with climate change, 
we've got to look at, and I talked a little bit about birch earlier, um, and birch often, a lot of the species do like it quite damp. Um, and actually, you will you see things like Jack Montii and, um, you know, the, the real common ones that we grow, you know, they do like some moisture. And with the, you know, that really warm summer that I talked about in 2018, I went down to a, um, a conference in Colchester and they were literally just keeling over. Um, there, were, there were trees that, and we've lost trees subsequently um, to, to periods of drought and they often don't die isolating months after. So looking at trees that are drought tolerant, and that's why I looked at the olives and things like that. So I am very conscious of the species that we choose. Um, and and actually, yeah, I, I completely agree. And things like I mentioned, the boxes, we, I wouldn't personally plant boxes in the minute because it's more susceptible to disease. So, yeah, there is thought and, and foresight that goes into it. And obviously, you can't predict things. Um, I'm sure there'll be diseases on... I mean, some of the, I'm sure some of the older people that are watching um, will have known elms as children. Well, I, I've, I've not grown up with elms. I've grown up with seeing the odd one, um, sort of a couple of great trees in, in, in Cambridge in one of the college gardens that have got a, a rare fungus on them that protected them from the, the Dutch elm disease. But, you know, elms have wiped out. And I remember going on a trip to Wales and seeing all the dead elms. But, um, you know, my generation, the ash are dying. And maybe my grandchildren won't, you know, they won't know what ash are. Um, and there might be something else. So I think we can never preempt things, especially the way that we import things and that the way that disease and spreads. It's the same with us. You know, you get we've, we've just been through a pandemic. The trees, the trees go through pandemics as well, and we and we don't think about them in the same way. But they're they're another species that that get they get attacked by um, viruses and diseases. So yeah, so we try and we try and plan, we try and predict, and we try and prescribe. But um, we're going to do our best. And then have you got any? particular pests and diseases of concern in the gardens at the moment that you haven't touched on yet or no not really i think i mean we garden organically um and if things if things can't hack it and um and they, they have to go um and i had a really interesting chat with a couple of guys who've got the national collection of portland roses because um we're with heritage and protecting some of the old things that have become susceptible we still want to preserve them because they're heritage um, and it's whether we keep them or whether we we look for new, you know, you, all the time we're looking for new cultivars that are disease resistant and um, and and are, are susceptible to certain pests. So yeah, it's um, yeah, if that answers the, if that answers the question, I'm not sure it does. Yeah, oh, brilliant. Thank you. Um, good stuff. Okay, where was I going to go next? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so a question, Helen, from Sophie, who asking how did Perennial begin? What's the sort of origin story of the charity? What who set it up? And, and, I, and I why? can answer that. I can. I am old enough to remember Dutch elm disease. My dad works <laughs> a lot of overtime then. Uh, yeah, ben isolated people. a whole chunk of the audience yeah, when he says so some of the old people remember um, elms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I wasn't around when we when when um, Perennial was formed. So. Um, 1839, it was it was created. It was then called the um, Gardeners Royal Benevolent Society. It was very much more than aimed at head gardeners of royal estates. So think Downton Abbey. Um, you know, people very high up that lost their hat, lost their job when they retired, lost their house. So some of the landed gentry created the charity. It moved on a few years later. Um, Charles Dickens and Sir Robert Peel were involved. And brought it forward a bit further. It increased very slowly up until the late 1998, when the board decided we can do more than this than just sending checks out and having a few bungalows. I'm not being derogatory, but that's effectively what it was. Um, and here we are 20 years later with a very large staff of supporting a significant amount of people. So we'd like to think Charles Dickens would be happy. That's all we all we can ever hope for in our day-to-day -day well, work is that want? as long exactly. as Charles Dickens is happy. We often think that here at the Arm Association as well. <laughs> uh, brilliant, thank you. And still going from strength to strength. I mean, it just it looks like it's um it's it, it's going well, I guess. You know, you're you're helping more and more people. Um our reach is becoming larger. We we know there's a minimum of three hundred thousand people working in the horticultural industries within the UK. Um, but it's not a record that's particularly accurate. There could be significantly more than that. Um, and we want really to, that everybody who works within the industry knows that they can get our support. We still have a lot of foresters that I have no idea that they can access our support. 
Yeah. We still have people who are self-employed who think that they can't. Um, and we are here to support everybody within the industry. That's brilliant. And I think hopefully a lot of people have learned about you tonight you didn't know previously. We, one thing, that this is a question from me, no one else, but um, you, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, Alan, about, and I'm looking at my notes here, but was it in, in the last six months or so, 60% of the people who've come to you have come for health reasons? Yeah, it's actually over the last 12 months. 12 we months. I completely monitor the whole time the reasons why people are coming through. I have to I look to see what issues may be coming up so we can be prepared for it. Is there anything we can do to negate it, to prevent it? But then I also look for what reasons people are coming through for. Yeah. So can we provide extra services? So for the last 12 months, over 60% of people coming through have been concerning physical and mental health. Um, and sorry, go on. No, no, sorry, I was just going to say, no, I guess... What I was going to say is that the people who are now coming through are usually below 55. The higher the percentage of people that we're looking after, after at the minute or working with are between 25 and 55. That's the highest demographic we've got people younger we've got people older but it's it's that so let's you know 25 to 55 is, is your working age group isn't it yeah yeah I, I guess what when you said that statistic the question that prompted in me was what sort of pre-covid kind of normal times what was the main thing then if it wasn't health what was the sort of what was the majority we, we still, reason then yeah we still had some health not not as much we had it was um debt lo low income um they were they were there was a lot around there there was a lot around um seasonal work not being able to get long you know long-term contracts monthly contracts so it'd be very much that there were seasonal that were getting laid off in whichever period of time and then not being able to financially get through the winter yeah. that was a lot of our work so at least 25 percent of the people that we work with are self-employed so we do a lot around a lot around supporting people of, of you know how to get through the year, how to not ignore your HMRC letters, tips of what you can claim for, what what you can't, and you will get caught out on them. But all the things that you you know the support of, of just being able to to balance balance your books basically, okay, look after your budgeting of your business and of yourself. Um, so we did a lot there, um, not so much at the moment because people are working. And to be, you know, there's a lot of work about at the moment, but things are changing. So we're kind of expecting that. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. I think we, we possibly lost Ben temporarily, or maybe permanently. I'm not sure. But that's <laughs> well, good. We've got, we've got plenty of questions for you. So we're just going to keep going on for now. We've got a couple more questions. Um, and then we'll see if Ben reappears, then uh, we shall ask him more. And if he doesn't, then we, we shan't. We were going to finish in about five minutes anyway. So, um, a question, a really good question that Maneeb has, has put in again, uh, asking whether or not perennial uh, helps horticulturalists beyond the UK. And I guess I'd follow up with another question from me. If, if you know, do you work with other organisations internationally who do similar things to you? There are a few in other countries. There's not, there's not many. In all honesty, benevolent funds are quite a Victorian British mm -hmm. Thing, in all honesty, um, pre the welfare state, there are some countries in the world that do have them. Um, so often, if people are, are moving to another country, we'll, we'll see if we can find one for them. Um, but no, we don't in, in between because because we come under the charity commission, we are we support people who live within the UK. However. There's always exceptions to the rule, isn't there? So Commonwealth War Graves, for instance, they work all over the world, but they are in fact employed and they are civil servants. Yeah. British civil servants. So we support them. Um, we support people and give them advice and information if they are British and working abroad. So we can give them advice and information as, be as bespoke as we can manage it. But depending where it is, there's some things that are just totally different. Sure. You know, so so not overly, I've got, I'll be honest with you. The advice and information on our website that people can use that is generic. So as the mental health support, yes, of course, people can access that as, as much as they want. However, there's some stuff it's very much UK, I'm afraid. Yeah. Thank you very much, Helen. So the answer there is uh, 
check out the uh, check out the website. Look who's here! <laughs> Actually, Hiya, can ben. I just answer one that I can see about workshops? Yes, please do. Is that okay? Cool. So, so yeah, we do do um, workshops, Andrew, for the perennial partners, for the larger firms who ask us to go in and do bespoke ones for what what they need. However, we are also working on other workshops, webinars, at, right at this moment that anybody can access. And what we're looking at is which ways that we would do that, that people would find the most useful. So we're looking at, can we do that through social media? Can we do that from our website or maybe a YouTube channel? So actually, if, if anybody's got any input on that, that then anybody can come along. So it wouldn't matter if you were on man band or there was just two of you, you could still access that free of charge. We'd be really interested to know which would be the way that people would be the most interested of accessing that. And on that, Helen, um, also we've had a question in from Ian about um, does Perennial have any pre-packed videos that can be used for staff training to raise I awareness do. as well? So what, what have yes. you got in that? Is that a look at the website thing again? Or? Um, yes, or just pass on my email and we can see what we can sort. Yeah, brilliant. So yes, Ian is the answer. Thank you very much. Welcome back, Ben. We thought we'd lost you there, but we got you back. You did lose me for a second. I'm on I'm on the 4G now. I'm not on the Wi-Fi. <laughs> no, well, we very we very nearly finished, so it's okay. There, there is a question I will um throw at you and then we'll move on towards our final question. Um it feels like quite a specific question, this, but I'm going to ask it, Ben, because you've come back to us from Heather. Uh, Heather's saying, will you and Jack be underplanting the area under the sails temporarily? Thanks for a great talk. The garden is looking fabulous. Yeah, it's interesting that, actually. Um, I, when I walked up under there and took the photo earlier, I, we, we, were we were actually just going to mulch it. Um, but there's a couple of... Um, we grow quite a few salaries in the garden, um, and there's... Mexican bush sage, which is salvia leucantha. There's a there's a really lovely. There's a few different cultivars we call white mischief. I did think I might proper load of. Um, it's lovely. It's got this amazing leaf that smells like blackcurrant. And um, flowers very late, but I thought about putting a little, little avenue, little underplant, a little avenue of um, salvia leucantha. So I may do that next year, but we will see. Um, it's up for it's up for debate amongst the team. <laughs> Democratically decided planting designs. Yeah, there's sometimes <laughs> democratic content, whatever I say. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got to get those legacy bits in, haven't you? That's where, that's where you get to, to put your foot down, surely. Jack puts a lot of legacy into the garden as well. He's a real, um, yes, we're right on man, and we, we make a lot of decisions together. And he's a, he's a great, great, he's an amazing plant. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's, we, we work in a democratic garden here. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we like to uh, that's what we like to see brilliant um okay look what i'm gonna do is there's a couple more questions left but we i think we'll, we'll wrap it up and we will ask our, our final question that we like to ask uh, our, our speakers uh, i'll go to ben first because we surprised helen with this earlier on so uh, we'll go to ben first ben what is your favorite tree related book or thing to do with trees or gardens or anything what's your favorite thing well I didn't. Do you know what the, the funny thing is? I can't actually find the book. I wanted to bring it to show you, but um, it's um, it's actually a book about woodland gardens uh, and gardening rather than trees specifically. But it's Dan Hinckley's book. Who is Dan Hinckley is a serious serious plantsman um, from America. We love a garden called Heron. I was at Heron's Wood. Um, I forgot the name of his new garden. Um, anyway, he's got an amazing book called The Explorer's Garden, um, and he's done a lot of plant hunting. Um, in the Himalayas and um, and elsewhere, and he's discovered and introduced lots of plants. Um, and this book is just is a little bible of unusual woodland plants. Um, it is a really really cool cool book. Uh, I try to think of the new. He's got a new book out as well for his new garden. Wait, Windcliffe is his new book. Um, but yeah, Dan Hinkley, the Explorer's Garden. If you're into plants, and you're into woodland plants. Get it. Fantastic, thank you. I was I was looking. See, Sophie's always very good and manages to write down the name and the the uh, the title before I managed to. I was going to look for a link to it, but I couldn't find it available anywhere other than uh, online stores that we don't want to be sharing links to in the chat. So, um, <laughs> other online retailers are available. He's a, he's a great speaker. Um, if you ever, if anybody ever gets a chance, he lectures internationally. Ever get a chance to hear him? Um, yeah, go and see him. 
Fantastic. Great choice. Good stuff. And Helen, over to you. We put pressure on earlier on for this. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, you did. And I'm going to fail everybody miserably. Mine is, um, I'm just currently, I am, I am training for a trek across the Sahara where there is no or very little trees. Um, but, but at the moment, because I live in North Yorkshire, um, in a very rural area with a sheep pen, um, is it's all to do with woodland walks for me at the moment. So woodland walks, first thing in the morning before I start work at eight o'clock. So this morning I was out at half past five and I think I'm going to start having to take my head torch out with me. It's getting dark. But that's, it's still dark. It's not on. <laughs> I think that's a very good answer. And Woodland Walks is just as good as books about woodland, I reckon. Although if your main answer is the Sahara, then you've definitely failed on oh, the challenge of favourite tree related there. thing. Yes, but the Woodland Walks, me, you will give me that. That's great. Thank you. Um, brilliant. Well, look, uh, Helen and Ben, thank you so much for uh, for that and for both your talks and for all your sharing your knowledge and everything with us. It's absolutely, it's brilliant. And as I say to everyone out there, we said already, Perennial is a fantastic charity. Please do support their work. Check out the website. Um, if you've got any more questions, send them to me, john at trees.org.uk, and I will pass them on. And if you get the chance at all to go up to uh, to Ben's garden, um, go and see Ben's garden because it's pretty brilliant. We'll try and do... Can we try and organise some trip or something there, Ben? Can We We can try and do that, can't we? In our association day out, let's, uh, let's try and do that. So uh, we'll try and organise something like that. But thank you both. Thank you to all of our audience watching. You're all wonderful. Um, please do consider signing up for conference next week. As I said, we're not going to have a webinar for a few weeks now, but we're going to come back with an actual organized program. I've, I've been saying it for more than a year, but I promise I'm going to sort it out. So uh, we're going to do that. You go and have fun and look after yourselves. We'll hopefully see you soon. Join us at the AGM tomorrow if you're a member, please. Uh, but otherwise, stay safe and uh, we'll see you shortly. Helen, Ben, everybody, thank you. Thank you.